Okay. Hello, everyone. This is the uh, third lecture of the biological module of the mini course on computation. And before the uh, lecture starts, let me have some quick announcement. So tomorrow is the last day uh, of the, uh, the mini course, and we are going to have a concluding lecture as well as a panel discussion with uh, most of the guest speakers. So I encourage you to uh, go to VBox. Yeah, you can scan this QR code or find the link in the email. Yeah, you can leave questions there or endorse the question asked by other students so that we can send the questions to the speakers earlier to let them think about it. And also I provide a link in the email on the feedback form required by the school. So I will be, I, I will appreciate a lot if you uh, like uh, willing to take a minute to fill it up. I'll also post the link in the chat maybe after this lecture. Okay, so now uh, let's start. And the topic of today is the challenges and hopes a tangle between biology and computation. So in the previous two lecture, we saw like a, a in interplay between biology and computation in both direction. And like, uh, let's follow the previous tradition in the two previous um, philosophic lectures. We are going to ask even more questions in today's lectures, trying to help us uh, like through these questions, understand the connection between biology and computation slightly better. In particular, maybe from the uh, direction of computation to biology, we can ask like, oh, how can we study computation in biology like uh, with uncertainties and unknowns and how can this uh, shed light on uh, biological phenomena? And on the other side, we can also ask like, uh, how can biology like uh, inspire uh, computation or maybe even beyond inspirations? Yeah, but first, uh, before we ask uh, even more uh, concrete questions, let us maybe uh, briefly review a little bit on what we have uh, discussed and covered in the previous lectures. So one of the main themes uh, we cover in the first lecture is uh, biological computations, which is like uh, how like a uh, biological, uh, different biological systems can perform different uh, computations. Especially we have seen uh, many, many examples. Yeah, like uh, this is actually just some selected example I try to cover. And also like our next uh, guest lecture uh, by Brabiba will cover. Yeah, this is just uh, like a very, very limited uh, selected uh, view of examples. And uh, for instance, we talk about like the molecular computing, which is probably the the, the, the most uh, microscopic scale of computing and the, the scale like of uh, like a uh, DNA actually is very, very similar like to a transistor. And we like through this animation, we kind of uh, have a feeling on like what do we mean by molecular computing and what's the flavor. And also in the uh, advanced section this afternoon, uh, Salvador will give a more like a concrete example, especially he's an expert in this field. And we also see, we also saw like uh, other examples, like for example, maybe in a more intermediate scale, like an immune system, which is uh, like a most people now, they probably all know this because of the pandemic. Yeah, we make analogy between the uh, immune system in our own body and like in computer security, where their high level goals are very similar. They are all trying to distinguish like foreign from what uh, it is uh, the part of our own system. And we also talk a little bit about swarm intelligence, like uh, how can like uh, ant, like slime mold or fish that naturally doing something have a computational flavor. And all of them like inspire some uh, algorithm and meta heuristics. And there are even more examples like we also briefly uh, saw in the next lectures talking about evolution and neuroscience. Yeah, as especially we view evolution as kind of like a computational principles. Yeah, it is uh, like a principle using basically like few ideas like, uh, like inheritable like traits. Yeah, and also like fitness and competitions, etc. And uh, we put this like high level computational uh, principle like uh, instantiate into like different examples and like across like a different uh, selection forces or like different levels of selections and even 
like uh, some examples in like a uh, seemingly unrelevant but uh, surprisingly quite uh, adequate uh, examples like uh, in the human culture. And later on, we also like uh, have a look into neuroscience, which is probably the, the biggest mystery uh, now we have in, in what, biology, in my opinion. Yeah, we saw that there are different levels in neural, neural like in our brain, and each level, or like even in the abstracted uh, level, they are all kind of doing some computation, but uh, in a in a quite different way than what we would imagine, like in the original like a uh, mathematical formulation. So, given all these uh, examples we have in so far, I guess it is quite natural to ask the following questions: It's like how do computations in the biological world different from like uh, how we see the mathematical and the physical world? Yeah, in particular, like uh, here. Like uh, I gave so many, many examples. Yeah, those are exactly trying to like uh, make you and even force you to think about like uh, what's the, I mean, when, when we talk about computation, this is a fuzzy, fuzzy uh, definition, fuzzy uh, term. Yeah, in the biological world, is that, uh, is it different from like when we talk about computation in mathematical world? So I encourage you to think about this and type in the chat. And, but in the meantime, I also provide a second question here. Yeah, like uh, after you think about the first question and type some of your thoughts. Yeah, what would be the difficulties in study computation in the biological world? If you think there are some difference, yeah, I mean, comparing to the mathematical and the physical world, which are like a more well studied. Yeah, what do you think would be the difficulties? So yeah, well, uh, you are welcome to type your thoughts in the chat right now and I'll monitor it and maybe read out some of them. And I probably won't have the time to read all of them but I'll definitely reply uh, later offline. But uh, please like uh, as we uh, did in the previous two lecture which was uh, very amazing, people typed lots of uh, discussions. And uh, I promised a uh, po like, post here for two minutes and afterwards I'll provide some of uh, some of my thoughts and some of the framework you can can might be helpful for you to think about questions and after that you can rethink about the questions again and type in the chat. So now I'll post for like one to two minutes. <clears throat> okay so Catherine type in the chat saying that it seems like uh, the computation in biological world and mathematical and physical world are, are the same thing, just uh, noisier. Do you want to elaborate uh, a little bit or like for other people, do you agree or disagree with uh, Catherine and why or why not? Yeah, or if you think this question is too broad, maybe one way to concretize your thought is like you can focus on one example you like the most, for example, DNA computing or like you know, evolution or neuroscience. Maybe you can focus on one example and in your head and try to think about and try to answer these questions like, oh, what's the difference when we say there's computation in that example? And how does it differ from what we have seen in the mathematical and the, uh, in, in the physical world? And uh, Catherine has a follow up saying that uh, in math and human design computer, we do our best to reduce noise yeah, and force stable outputs. And also with rigorous proofs and uh, non reversible CMOS gates, etc. Yeah, how in uh, DNA, yeah, up and down regulation over lots of uh, wiggle room. Yes, that's a, that's a very, very nice uh, summary and a comparison. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> mm, do people have more thoughts? <clears throat> okay, so maybe if you are typing, uh, please uh, continue to do that but I'll slowly move on by providing some more context and more framework for you to think and also 
tell you a little bit about my thoughts, but uh, you're more than welcome to continue uh, thinking and typing. So actually what I'm going to first say about um, is inspired by some of our discussion in the uh, guest lecture yesterday by Zichen talking about art and computation. In particular, at some point, some people suddenly ask, uh, like, uh, is there a purpose of life? Yeah, like, uh, is there a purpose for, for human being, etc." So in fact, to answer these questions, or I mean, even trying to just to attempt, yeah, or I mean, before we really give a, like a concrete answer to this, yeah, it's like, I want to give you some clarification and also maybe some, some common biological terms to help you think about this. So actually in the study of biology, there are, there are two similar notions, yeah, very along this line of uh, asking the purpose of life. Yeah, they are proximate causes and ultimate causes. Yeah. And what do they mean? So proximate causes, maybe you can think of uh, those are like uh, asking for some explanation, like for, for example, like for the function of an organism. Yeah, for example, I don't know why, why the, the function of our eyes. And also maybe asking about the explanation for the developing process of that. Yeah, so basically it's more about like asking like, oh, like uh, how, how, how and why, yeah, like uh, the, our genetic or somatic program can be decoded in this certain way and give this kind of functionality of organisms. So this kind of touches the purpose, maybe like a quote, quote, purpose of like organism, like either like uh, through the like eye level or maybe even for an individual. And there's also another notion called uh, ultimate causes. And it is also like asking for explanation for certain purpose, quotation mark here. Yeah, but it is maybe asking more in the historical lens. Yeah, asking in the more like the origin part or like the, like, uh, like uh, through the lens of evolution, like uh, why, yeah, we will have uh, this kind of organism. Yeah, or why like a certain species got selected, etc. So at first glance, yeah, it, you, you might feel like, oh, so it seems that in biology, when people ask about proximate causes and try to answer and try to understand things through proximate and ultimate causes, it is already uh, trying to answer these questions of the purpose of life. But if we pause for, for a second, and uh, look back to this uh, quote we saw in the previous lecture uh, by uh, Richard Dawkins saying that evolution has no long-term goal. There's no long distance target, no final perfection to serve as a, a criterion for selection. So why in the meantime, when uh, biologists, they study proximate causes and ultimate causes, but they also say, oh, evolution is kind of a having no goal if we call goal as the purpose of life. Yeah, so what, what happened? What is uh, really going on here? So maybe as, at least for me, the, uh, my own interpretation is like, uh, for this kind of uh, proximate causes and ultimate causes way, or trying to tackle or trying to attempt, uh, like uh, answering this question of the purpose of life, they're actually maybe not really literally answering what's the purpose of life, but it's more like in retrospect, how can we explain the history or how to explain what uh, emerges right now? But uh, in, the, in their mind, in the biologist's mind, most of the biologist's mind maybe, or like evolutionary biologist's mind, yeah, most of the things still don't have a long-term purpose. Yeah, the purpose more is like it emerged and then you explain. But uh, at this moment, you can you probably cannot really say, yeah, the evolution, yeah, the which happening right now has a certain purpose or has certain goal. So I hope uh, this uh, clarification and like by also introducing the uh, notions of proximate cause and uh, ultimate cause can help you already start to think a little bit about the the difference between uh, biological computation and the other computation, computation in the other world. Especially, I hope this already uh, maybe hinted you uh, the following notion I want to advocate, yeah, which is the open-endedness in biology. 
So as I mentioned, like uh, Richard Dawkins, yeah, or like uh, most of the evolutionary biologists will tell you evolution is blind. And in the meantime, uh, if you look at our human societies or like uh, or observe uh, in the in the nature, lots of great achievements, yeah, probably is not really planned. Yeah, it's like uh, what if you even imagine yourself, yeah. Yeah, lots of the, the good achievements you have, maybe you didn't plan in the beginning. But in the meantime, this is also not the true story. You still plan a lot. Yeah, you still do some optimization, maybe locally. Yeah, maybe you still plan to, oh, I want to study hard. Yeah, or like, oh, I want to do some research. So, and oh, Chinese mini course is very relevant. So I want to take it. Yeah, and I want to really uh, study really hard and follow his lectures. So it's like a, in, in, in real life or in, in reality, although we said uh, probably uh, evolution in long term is blind and lots of great achievements uh, is, is not really planned, but there's also still some optimization and small goals uh, happening in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the middle. And this is like a very ubiquitous, both in the physical world and biological world and even human uh, society. Yeah, so these notions of open-endedness, although maybe in the very, very high level and maybe microscopic level do capture something, but uh, we also, from our experience, we also know that this kind of local optimization or local small goals, or like in this book, they also use the term of uh, small stepping stones, still take an important part. So probably, although in biology, I want to emphasize the difference maybe is on the like a goal list uh, structure of the computation. But in the meantime, we also know that there are probably still some small goals uh, in the middle. So, so the questions probably will be like, how can we study this kind of big open endedness while still incorporating with like this kind of local optimization and small goals? And perhaps, if we want to understand the computation in biological world better, we perhaps uh, need, need a, a, a new theory like for study open-endedness and incorporate it with like, a, like the traditional computation thinking. Yeah. So I hope you can keep continue thinking and also uh, type your thoughts in the chat. Yeah. But to continue, yeah, the discussions of like the difference between uh, biology and other like math and, and physics uh, when it comes to computation. Then we have definitely have to mention this, uh, the emergent uh, property. So we have already seen some examples and it's, uh, I mean, it's impossible to, to explain all the examples. But uh, just to remind people, the high level idea of uh, emergence is like uh, probably similar, a little bit similar to when we talk about chaotic phenomenon or like a hash function. It's like uh, actually starting from something, yeah, yeah, something you, you, you actually can know very well, like the DNA sequence, you really can literally know the uh, DNA symbols pretty well. But through some simple, simple rules like uh, oh, like uh, protein synthesis, etc., like lots of a uh, develop development in process, it can end us with something like a uh, crazily complicated and structured. Yeah, for example, our our own being or my cat Shiva are all coming from like uh, just some original DNA sequence and following also some very local simple rules, but ended up with. Uh, very, very different, but also very structured and complicated existence. So this kind of emergence property is very ubiquitous in, in biology. And uh, although it is also happening in physics and math, yeah, but on one hand, it is less study. And on the other hand, it's like a lot of uh, important things people can study layers actually can somehow bypass this kind of uh, emergence phenomenon and still have a good understanding. So it seems that when we're talking about computation in biology, we at some point definitely need to face uh, emergent uh, properties, emergent phenomena, and try to have a better sense on how to, how to uh, study it. And indeed, like uh, we saw in the lecture uh, 3A, like uh, Turing have this uh, theory of like Turing patterns 
it's like a first step of trying to understand emergent phenomenon uh, better. But my question here, or like a, it's like a follow up uh, inspiration, like uh, trying to uh, understand the difference of computation between biological and the other world. It's like to study emergence property, maybe we first need to think about like uh, what, ki what kind of understanding are we seeking for? For example, we could uh, maybe we are we are trying to uh, understand like through using another black box to help us make prediction. And for example, if you still remember in the alpha fold example of like Google using deep learning to predict the protein structure, yeah, it is kind of like this. Yeah, it is also studying certain uh, like uh, emergence of phenomenon. And it used another black box in a sense that we actually don't know how deep learning really work, but uh, at least it maps the input output phenomenon pretty well. Yeah, this could be the one uh, way to understand an emerging ph phenomenon. And in the meantime, it could also be like a, a mechanical understanding. For example, this is like a, what Turing did in the Turing pattern. He has like some differential equations and like simple two variables, like two morphogens uh, and model the phenomenon pretty well. Yeah. And we potentially, although probably don't yet have an example, is like maybe people can also have a concrete uh, mathematical characterization, maybe similar to what Turing did, and can characterize like a uh, different phenomena very well, but potentially this may be, may be complicated. And also maybe we understand it through a more high level computational principles like uh, evolutions. If you think of evolution, it's also kind of an emergent phenomenon. Then nature selection is also, also provides an understanding for this uh, emergent phenomenon. And it is through a more like a computational principle way. And uh, perhaps we can also have like abstract theory and produce, yeah, reproduce some uh, emergent phenomenon like the game of life, if you know what I'm saying about. But here it's like maybe like the study through some totally abstract, maybe biological irrelevant model, but can reproduce some interesting emergent phenomena. So here are just some of my thoughts like, oh, if we want to study emergent phenomenon, if we want to seek for like certain understanding, what's the possible uh, understanding we probably can hope for. And to me, they all seem uh, quite legitimate. And maybe in long run, actually we need to incorporate uh, different uh, thinking and understanding together. Yeah. So hope, uh, yeah, this also help you, uh, uh, like uh, provide you some of the materials and framework to think about the difference of computation in, in biology and other worlds. And finally, maybe before we move on to the second part, let me also address the second question a little bit about the difficulties in studying biology. So as we seen, like uh, probably, yeah, from the previous two uh, characteristics of a biological computation, I want to emphasize the open-endedness and the emergence. We probably can also feel, have a feeling that it is uh, drastically different from traditional computation in mathematical and physical worlds. And immediately we will face a uh, lot of difficulty, especially like the traditional tools can be, cannot be used. <clears throat> And if we really want, to, really want to concretize the difficulties, in my opinion, there are roughly five big challenges. So first is exactly what uh, Catherine um, <clears throat> mentioned in the chat. It's like uh, there are lots of noise in, a, in the biological world. In particular, sometimes, uh, maybe this is my bias uh, view, Sometimes I even feel like noise, noise could be greater than signal. Yeah, which make like, which even might uh, distract people and mis mislead people. And also other than noise, there are also lots of spatial cases in, in the biological world, which also could uh, potentially confuse people. So maybe one way to think about this, you can also think about the analogy I made in the very beginning as a biology as a plain jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, there are also lots of uh, flavor can be captured by that energy. And the second difficulties in my opinion 
is the lake of like a first principles. How do we mean? How, how do I mean by first principle? It is like a very fundamental axioms or postulates. So we know that mathematics uh, is really like a standing up from those like a first like axioms. And one of the great success, or like when people talk about the unreasonable effectiveness of uh, math in physics, in my opinion, one reason is also like because in physics, people can have lots of good first principles. They can identify lots of, uh, they can really study physical phenomena from the like the lowest level and, and like uh, using deductions and have a very good understanding. But in biology, it seems to be uh, much more difficult. In particular, when we talk about emergent phenomenon, it is built on top of like a, like a lots of uh, complicated, although simple, uh, like a, like a mechanisms. So having like a, yeah, the lake of first principles in biology, in my opinion, could is also one of the source of uh, difficulties. And on the other side, it is maybe on the other side, yeah, it's, it's like there's also a lake of a top-down framework or like a unifying framework. For example, in the, in the, in the physics module, we talk about like a, after the falling apple and we talk about the importance of Newton laws. It is like a axiom, axioms or like a unifying, uh, like a worldview for us to study physical world. And, but in, in biology, maybe also due to the lots of special cases, et cetera, it is much difficult to have a top-down like unifying framework. Maybe for a specific species or problems you are interested in, you can do that. But in a broader uh, scale, it is really difficult. Perhaps one of the, the only example I can come with probably just the uh, natural selection. It is probably uh, really, in my, in my own opinion, the only big framework, unifying framework you have like, a, like of the same levels as like a Newton's law. So in biology, we really uh, lack of this kind of unifying big framework. And the fourth uh, difficulties, I would probably say it's like a mechanical understandings. Yeah, this is maybe the one of the comfortable way people to understand stuff. As uh, many people actually pointed out in the previous uh, lecture. Yeah, in biology, it seems to be that either sometimes very vacuous in the sense that, oh, you can write it down, but you, I mean, it doesn't really uh, tell us anything if you just say, oh, everything is formed by like uh, from DNA and you do some decoding following certain physical laws. It's not super illuminating, although this is a true statement. And or it can be a situation like, okay, now you really want to simulate it and write the program down, but it becomes uh, unanalyzable. So it seems to me that mechanical understanding in biology seems to face this kind of a dichotomy situation. And uh, finally, yeah, like summarizing all this uh, four difficulty, this also cause uh, social challenges. Yeah, when I observe biologists, although I don't have too many samples, for example, when I look at my roommates, I can see that actually lots of uh, challenges is also about like uh, communicating with other researchers. And it is exactly because of previous four difficulty. So it is very difficult to let you have like a common sense or like a consensus on certain topics. So biologists also need to spend lots of time like uh, to convince or prove the ideas to each other. So I guess all this uh, point, I just want to emphasize that the difference from biology to like mathematics and physics and for people, especially from other fields, other than biologists like me, I'm not a biologist, yeah, if we want to really look at and study biology, we probably really need a really different way of thinking. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'll provide uh, some good, re good reading if you are interested in, in uh, like thinking more about the difference and difficulties in biology. Uh, but now, yeah, given, after giving my thoughts, yeah, maybe it's also a good time for people to post like a, Few minutes and type your thoughts in the chat. Oh, I already uh, see one. Let me drink some water and read it.
I see. So, so he mentioned in the chat that um, in biological computation, nature's part participation is the most important role. It's like there is the feeling of life because we are natural creature. But in human design computational model, there is feeling or sense that machine can feel, I think so. Yeah. I'm not sure. Are you saying that in the human design computational model, there's there's slightly less about or lack of, lack of feeling or sense? Yeah, if I interpret that, yeah, okay. Yeah, so if that, yeah, yeah, I, I kind of uh, quite agree. Yeah, and yeah, this is exactly one of the, yeah, how to say, one of the things you need to get used to when, if you are starting from a more mathematical, like for example, like me, if you remember in some previous lecture, I share a quote and I said, that crow is the very first sentence I wrote in my, uh, SOP when I apply for grad school. It's like, let's say that, oh, the reason people like mathematics, yeah, probably is because it's freedom. Yeah, you can do lots of uh, stuff there. As composed, as opposed to like a physics or, or biology, you really restricted it by, by nature. Yeah, and, and we really don't understand nature. And, and as opposed, like in, in math, we can design things and, and create stuff. Yeah, indeed, that's a, is less a difficulty. Mm -hmm. Do people have uh, more comments and thoughts? Yeah, you're welcome to uh, continue uh, yeah, typing. I, saw, I just saw another uh, comments and uh, another. Yeah, but due to time limit, I'll move on. But uh, please continue writing. I'll, as you see previously, I definitely will re reply to all of them. Okay, so let's uh, move on yeah, to the second part of this lecture. And uh, in particular, I decided to focus on brain and cognition. Yeah, and rather than evolution, because evolution is maybe more well studied. For brain and cognition, maybe they are, there's the, the focus of the next century, in my opinion. So before we talk about biology, actually, I want to remind people a little bit about the Penrose three worlds view we talked about uh, yesterday. And we mostly focus on platonic world and physical worlds, and we have lots of interesting philosophical discussion there. But today, we finally are going to tackle perhaps the, le the least understanding world, which is our mental world. So in the neuroscience uh, lecture, yeah, we talk about like in neuroscience, there are like different levels of studies from like cells level, yeah, to maybe more like a network level. And also there are some abstraction level where people abstracted out uh, like certain part of the brain and purely study the mathematics there. And in less than uh, half an hour, Prabhupada is also going to talk about uh, some example, probably more in a behavioral level. And there are even, even more different ways of studying uh, in neuroscience. But all this is uh, suggesting that the study of neuroscience is uh, really diverse, not only about like the different uh, like aspects, but also in the different levels and different scale. Yeah, you could start with like a very, very button uh, level and try to understand all the like a chemical or like the molecular trace. But you could also like studying a very top level, focus on behavior or even like, uh, I don't know, consciousness or psychology. So in my opinion, uh, one of the main challenges in neuroscience is exactly how to uh, bridge in the bottom up approaches, like say in the cell level, and the top down approaches, say from behavior or the um, psychology uh, experiments. And indeed, there are actually some, uh, some success and Prabhupada probably will mention a few. Yeah, but in general, people still, uh, I mean, far away from bridging the two very well. So the two questions for this part is, first, like uh, any thoughts or any like a random idea or brainstorming idea on like, uh, how can we, like what's the potential way can we bridge the bottom up and top down approaches? 
And the next question maybe is more from a serious side. Yeah, so as, uh, I mean, we still may be far away from having very, very good understanding on everything. Yeah, what can we infer from a totally abstract series? Yeah, like in, in physics, maybe one way to view at it is a surprising like a match between an abstract series and the physical reality. And in biology, although we haven't uh, seen like such a great success, but uh, can we hope for something similar? Or if not, how can abstract series or especially the abstract mathematical series can teach us anything about the brain? So I'll similarly pause here for maybe one to two minutes for you to think a little bit about it. And then I'll uh, talk about some of my thoughts and provide some, some food for thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw some um, uh, comments in the chat. I'm not so sure if uh, this is uh, for this question or continuing the previous questions, but uh, I'll keep monitoring it. Yeah, and feel free to keep chatting. I'll definitely ca carefully take a look uh, offline after lectures. Okay, there seems to be a relevant uh, comments by uh, Sana saying that the top-down and bottom approaches can be, oops, can be compared to the same problem in physics, maybe. Uh, yes, I actually like this comment in a sense that we're trying to draw analogy, yeah, like to other well-studied uh, phenomena in, in other fields. Yeah, and indeed in physics, there are also this kind of phenomena. So it is very good if we can learn some lesson from the study in other fields. Okay, I also saw Rayo posted uh, some questions. Yeah, about the difficulty. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's probably difficult to have a total synergy between bottom up and, and top down approaches, but it is important to have some communication between the different approaches. Yes, I completely agree. And uh, this probably, I, I, I hope I, I hope most researchers have uh, this awareness in mind. And from my observation, it is indeed the case. But this also have some difficulties, I mean, in reality to do that because the language barrier and also time issues. But indeed, in long run, I completely agree, like the communication is very, very important. Okay, so perhaps I'll, I'll move on and people are welcome to continue in the discussion. And actually the first thing I'm going to talk about actually is very related to what Sana suggested is to actually learn from the experience of other successful serial field. Yeah, for example, we have seen the uh, evolution theory, which in my opinion, one of the greatest theory in biology. It is like a providing a very good computational theory or computational principles to help explaining so many different explanation, uh, phenomena yeah, by instantiating into like different stuff. In particular, like nature selection provide us a framework rather than a concrete model in my opinion. And it allows like different instantiations where it still can stay abstract and high level. So from my view, it's like, a, it probably is very important in the study of biology, especially if we talk about the brain, probably we cannot hope for like, a, I mean, come up with a, perfect model like right away. Yeah, we probably we, what more reasonable to hope for is like this kind of like a framework or computational principle like evolution. And we just instantiate into like a different uh, cases and can have a useful understanding in the brain. So potentially probably the computational principle for the study of brain can be the bridges for like the top down, uh, top down approach and the bottom up approach. And indeed, uh, people are thinking about that, especially, I mean, uh, in this uh, mini course and this module, we are talking about computation uh, in like uh, biology or like in brain. And indeed, people are trying to thinking about like, uh, like maybe brain itself is just a computer. And uh, people have lots of discussion and through different ways. And it turns out that actually, even when we talk about saying that, oh, brain might be a computer, 
uh, people interpret it quite differently. So here, similar to what we discussed in the physical lecture, I'll also provide a glimpse into several different branches of uh, this philosophical philosophy uh, discussion called computationalism, which think of brains as a computer. So the first uh, branch is like a more, maybe the highest level. Yeah, it is thinking of like uh, our behavior or like the, the cognitive levels uh, behavior is like a, uh, a computer. So like in classicism, yeah, people trying to have lots of computational models for like uh, cognitive activities and they slightly care less about the button implementation. So it's slightly disconnected to like uh, the, the button uh, neuroscience. And there's another branch called uh, connectionism. Yeah, and maybe this is more familiar to like a uh, computer science people, especially if you are working in uh, machine learning. So there, they focus more on like the, like say the intermediate the uh, uh, hardware level. They think the connection of like neurons is very important. And that's the, the main source of uh, computer com computations you can see in the brain. So they abstractly out like the connection, like the neural network and try to see like what kind of uh, computation can emerge from that and what can we like uh, say anything about that. And they still focus maybe more on the high, higher level. And after they, they abstract it out and call this artificial neural nets, they probably not exactly very, I mean, like the, exactly the same as the biological neural networks. And sometimes even will be, I mean, totally non-biologically plausible, but this is another branch. And maybe uh, the third uh, branch uh, I would call is like the computational neuroscience. So this is like a more closer to the bi biological side where people like have lots of computational model for concrete neural systems. So in uh, Brabibas talk, you probably will see more example. And uh, also if you type computational neuroscience, you can see some good textbook I also provide as a reference. Oops. And uh, to me, like all these three uh, branches of computationalism uh, are quite legitimate and have some sense. And maybe what I want to remark here is just that, oh, perhaps what we need is the, to think about how to integrate in integrated like this kind of different thinkings and maybe they together can can provide us uh, like a general uh, understanding of the brain probably one i mean each alone probably is difficult like uh, to attack this big problem but together with different views maybe we can have a better big picture okay so finally yeah this is the last slide i want to uh, make an analogy again yeah, but this time I want to uh, talk about music theory. Yeah, I want to say maybe uh, music theory can serve as uh, inspiration for us to study like uh, neuroscience or biology. So I hope people can can hear the sound. Yeah, but uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, music uh, by Bach, one of my favorite uh, composers. Maybe my favorite composer. This is his uh, area of uh, his uh, Gober variation. So as people might not know, like Bach is a German composer in the 18th century, and he's often considered as the father of music. So he's a master of like a harmonic, counterpoint, etc., lots of music techniques. And he had left like more than thousands wonderful pieces to our future generation. So Bach is very famous uh, for his rigorous like uh, compositions with like forms and rules, but his music are still very melodic and, in my opinion, sometimes very romantic. And uh, however, today maybe I won't talk too deep into Bach. Actually, uh, maybe uh, I want to uh, uh, tell you a story when I encountered in last semester when I took a music theory, and hope this can and inspire you a little bit uh, about the potential of uh, study biology. So uh, for people who don't know music theory is totally fine. Yeah, but uh, for example, when I took this uh, music theory, the professor talked about like some structures and rules for us to study music. 
In particular, like those rules are like quite rigorous. Like for example, there are things called sentence and periods. It's talking about the structure of music should like、uh, be very specific in, in certain way. But after he finally like explained like what sentence and period is, he immediately said, "You probably won't see any composer literally follow this rule." But why music theory is still very important and relevant, even though lots of the rules and forms we talk about in music theory class may not be really happening in the real world music. So, in my opinion, although music theory, and if we think of it as a platonic world, and the real music as like a physical reality or even our mental reality activity, although it's not exactly cap like characterizing it. But it can extract useful patterns, and it also provides a language for us to communicate with each other. And、uh, most importantly, maybe it it is framework to lift our appreciation to music. So isn't that I mean, unless are exactly what we want for biology. So perhaps yeah, I mean, different from like the physical series, like we really want very precise、uh, prediction and understand understanding and match the reality. Perhaps for biology, we need something like a music theory. It itself、uh, may be self-contained and rigorous, but、uh, to us,、uh, when we want to study biology, yeah, we we actually just want to have some useful, useful way to understand and communicate and lift our understanding and appreciation to our brain, to biology in general. So hope this analogy makes sense to you and、uh, can inspire you in some way. But、uh, now maybe you can feel free to continue us、uh, typing your thought down、uh, in the chat, and、uh, maybe I'll read the chat uh, 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 afterwards. But let me quickly give a, a summary, and、uh, so that the next speaker can have more time to、uh, prepare. So in summary, today we talk about、uh, we raise more questions, yeah, for us to think about the connection between uh like a computation and biology. We talk about the difference of、uh, computation in biological world and then mathematics and physics, and talk about the difficulties, and also try to brainstorm a little bit about like how to bridge the different level of understandings, and perhaps talk about how can we infer from the abstract series. In the end, I use music theory as、uh, an energy for answering the final questions. So I hope this is actually just the starting point of your journey in thinking about like、uh, biology questions of like thinking about brain. And、uh, for the 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 future part of、uh, this mini course, we are almost at the end. So next、uh, in ten minutes, probably Bai is going to give a guest lecture on animal intelligence. And in the afternoon,、uh, it's although it's like slightly in a different time, it is one hour ahead of our usual time. Salvador is going to talk about、uh, molecular computing in his advanced section. And tomorrow, before the concluding lecture, I'll also talk about black holes. And finally, we will have our concluding lectures with uh, many of uh, students uh, presenting their thoughts and experience. And then we will end up with the panel discussions. Where、uh, people can ask question and interact with our guest speakers. So this is the end of、uh, this lecture. I'll put more references on、uh, on Discord as well as our、uh, reference document sent out will be sent out soon. And thank you all for your attention.